Okay, um, we're about to get started. It's 5.30. Um, I'm Eric Snyder. I'm a partner here at Jones Day. Um, frankly, I'm honored to be introducing uh, the members of this great panel. Um, just a quick word about the rule of law from my perspective. Um, I came here from the State Department not very long ago, and when I was being considered uh, for the partnership here, I had to meet with the chairman of the firm, who runs our firm worldwide, in five continents, 43 countries, his name's Steve Brogan. And I had an hour uh, to, I guess, either convince him that I was worthy of the partnership or, or convince him otherwise that I wouldn't be standing here now today. Um, and I didn't know what the topic was. Um, I think a lot of law firms would focus on the commercial aspects on what kind of business or clients could this prospective partner bring into the firm? Could this partner keep lots of hardworking young lawyers busy for 10 hours a day, five, six days a week in the San Paolo office or the Washington office? But that's not what Steve Brogan wanted to talk about. Um, it was uh, a bit surprising, actually. He was explaining to me, and it wasn't something I was thinking about, right? Because I came to his office here in Washington where you don't think about how important the rule of law is in this world. But he wanted to talk to me about the rule of law in the world and how, as a partner of this firm, with 43 countries, about 43 offices in 43 countries um, on five continents, that it was our responsibility in a great many of those places to do our part to contribute to the rule of law being upheld in those places. And I thought it was an interesting way to have my interview for this firm. Then, not many weeks later, when I began at the firm, it was my first week I worked out of Sao Paulo office down in Brazil. And it was my first week there, and I was asked to participate in a conference, the Bingham Center, Rule of Law Conference in Sao Paulo. And, um, and I sat there for two solid days and listened to some incredibly interesting speakers, including the former president, um, Fernando Vicky Cardoso of Brazil, probably the one president of Brazil since the uh, military, military uh, dictatorship that hasn't been tarnished with some corruption allegations or worse. And I sat there thinking, wow, so it wasn't just talk. Like, this is an event sponsored by Jones Day with the Bingham Center. And I learned quite a lot about what the Bingham Center does. And frankly, I was impressed. And it was during that conference just a few months ago when I met Matt Trump, um, who is the project lead and senior research fellow at the Global Rule of Law Exchange Bingham Center for the Rule of Law. And I think if we just take a moment now to have Matt explain a little more, because he can do it far more uh, articulately than, than Matt. Go ahead. Thank you, Eric. Um, my name is Matt Chong uh, from the Bingham Center for the Rule of Law. Um, let me just spend just a few minutes really um, explaining what the Bingham Center for the Rule of Law really is about and how this sort of relationship which I'll say um, emerged. Um, the Bingham Center for the Rule of Law was uh, founded in 2010. Uh, we are based in the United Kingdom, in London. Uh, it was named uh, after the Lord Bingham of Cornell, uh, who was one of the <coughs> senior judges of his generation. Uh, a passionate advocate for the rule of law, um, who wrote a pretty influential seminal book called The Rule of Law, um, in which he defines the rule of law uh, according to eight sort of principles that we sort of ever since distilled, but we sort of use that as a, as a principle to really sort of start addressing rule of law issues uh, internationally. Um, the Bingham Center for the Rule of Law, we, we work on, um, we do apply research with practical applications. Uh, we do that internationally, as well as it in the United Kingdom. Um, in the United Kingdom, we, we work on schools projects, so educating um, um, young children. Um, but we also work on issues such as uh, access to justice, uh, constitutional issues, uh, issues such as judicial independence, judicial appointments, uh, issues such as uh, public administration, uh, and so on and so forth. A little bit of corruption, of course, uh, which is uh, how uh, you know, how we sort of come to, to this event tonight. Um, the relationship with John Say uh, is such that John Say is our global partner uh, for the Global Rule of Law Exchange, a project that, um, through which we organize this event, uh, a project through which we also organize uh, the event that, uh, that uh, Eric was just alluding to a second ago. I think that's about it. Of course, we'd be delighted to, to provide any more information about the Bingham Center or the exchange. 
Uh, some information out there as well, in case you're interested, um, you can look up a, a couple of leaflets and, and flyers. Um, so I to say, very happy to be here today. Thank you so much really, to Eric, to our distinguished panelists, to Story and all the Dijon State team really for uh, putting this up and facilitating this uh, discussion. <coughs> Thank you, Matt. Um, of course. So now I'd like to just introduce our speakers. Um, uh, first, we're going to have Lynn Hammerbrin. Um, Lynn is uh, an independent consultant specializing in rule of law, anti-corruption, and general governance issues. Until 2008, she was a senior public sector management specialist in the World Bank. And before that, she spent 12 years managing administration of justice projects for USAID. Um, she's been described as a force of nature, someone who's unafraid to uh, say it the way she thinks it is, or uh, uh, speak uh, very truthfully about the issue she confronts. She's also published some excellent work on judicial reform in Latin America. Um, after Lynn, we're going to have <coughs> former special agent Deborah Lepravant, who is a senior investigator for the century where she traces the proceeds of foreign corruption and violent kleptocracy in Africa. She recently retired as a special or a supervisory special agent, which is even higher than just a special agent with the FBI. Um, she was a boss. She was there for 20 years, and she was with the United States Department of Defense for five years. Um, while she was at the FBI, she was the FBI's expert in international money laundering and asset recovery, and she traced and seized more than $1 billion in corruption proceeds. She also, and this is uh, very impressive, she initiated the FBI's kleptocracy program. Um, she's also a forensic scientist and is a part-time professor at the George Washington University. After Deb, we will hear and have the pleasure of hearing the unique and interesting perspective of Thomas uh, Donan. Thomas is the co-founder and executive director for the Center for Transparency and Accountability in Liberia. He's a Liberian national. He studied at the University of Liberia and Harvard University. Um, he is also the national coordinator of the Coalition for Transparency and Accountability in Education, which focuses on highlighting systemic weaknesses in Liberia's education sector and generating strategies to improve educational outcomes. Thomas championed key transformative legislation such as the Liberia Anti-Corruption Commission Act, Freedom of Information Act, New Education Reform Act, Public Financial Management Act, Public Procurement and Concession Act, Whistleblowers Act, uh, Whistleblowers Protection Act, and Liberia Extractive Industries Transparency Act, which I'm not sure what it is, but it sounds like he's basically responsible for passing every law in Liberia. Um, he previously worked in the economic and commercial section of the United States Embassy in Monrovia. Um, after, and finally, after we hear from Thomas, we're going to hear uh, from a very experienced and accomplished U.S. federal prosecutor, Peter Ainsworth. Um, Peter has been around a long time. Uh, I myself recall as a very young uh, prosecutor uh, in 2000. 1999, seeing him on the elevator of the building, we both worked as federal prosecutors. He's an especially accomplished prosecutor in the area of public corruption investigations and prosecutions. He served as a senior anti-corruption counsel in the United States Department of Justice Criminal Division. He advises U.S. government officials, foreign governments, and representatives of multinational organizations on anti-corruption enforcement issues and helps U.S. ambassadors and high-level government officials to manage projects aimed at strengthening U.S. law enforcement capacity. Prior to that, Peter was Senior Deputy Chief of Litigation at the highly regarded Public Integrity Section in the United States Department of Justice Criminal Division. In this position, he supervised and directed a staff of career prosecutors who investigate and prosecute public corruption in the United States. Um, Peter is someone that I'm, I'm sure you'll enjoy hearing at the very end of our long list of distinguished panelists. 
Um, I will just lay out the program for today, and that is each of the speakers will have about eight minutes, and I'm going to hold them to it. Um, if they drift over a minute or two, we'll allow it. But what we're trying to do is to save approximately 45 minutes for questions, whether they're questions from the panelists to other panelists or from the audience. And we encourage all of you to ask anything and everything you want, especially with Lynn, and you might get a very interesting response. Um, so one last point before we start. Um, this is on the record. This is being recorded, um, as Matt mentioned, so that others can watch it and benefit from the experience and brilliance, uh, brilliance of this panel. So uh, with that, I ask Lynn to be off there to step on up. Or, or from there, wherever you'd like. Uh, alone. 
important. But the sale of sentences and issues of budgets, the funds just aren't that great. And what people quoted to me in Latin America, how much it cost to buy a judge, say, in Peru, it was not that much. And in Africa, the, the, the amounts that I was quoted and the amounts that I mentioned in the Ethiopia report were actually quite small. So maybe it's grand corruption in the sense that you are selling justice, but it's not grand in the sense of, um, of having a, a representing large funds. However, in Africa, as opposed to some countries that are moving somewhat further ahead, I think system actors are still more likely to be leaned on by the politically powerful to tailor their decisions to their choices. In Latin America and in Eastern Europe, two other reasons why the judges become somewhat more independent. And if they sell their sentences, they, you know, their judgments, they do it because they want to, not because they have to. Except, and this is something that happens in Latin America, but not so much in Africa, there's the, the lead or silver argument. Uh, threats to life and to family probably are more common in other regions as regards uh, judges and prosecutors than in many African countries, not all. Now, why the correction? Um, political interference is one reason. Uh, another very important reason is lack of resources. I'm not big on giving more budgets and higher salaries to judges everywhere. I think there, the poverty of the sector is often exaggerated, but certainly some of the situations I saw in Africa were so dire that a judge obviously either had to legally take up the work or take bribes if he or she was going to live. Um, and then there, another reason is the, uh, another factor, and also probably due to, to scarce resources, is the lack of monitoring and accountability systems. Uh, these are poor countries, and it's very difficult to, to have records kept as to what, what judges or even their clerks are doing out there beyond the capital city. Smaller concerned public, fewer NGOs, and those that are interested in corruption probably less concerned with that in the judiciary. And finally, in many of these countries, in most of these countries, a very small public uses the courts. Uh, and if they use the police and prosecutors, it may be unwillingly, but it's been estimated, and I have no idea where the figure comes from, that almost 15% of the population really has a chance of having access to the system. Now, if you have a system that is corrupt, or has corruption, or it is not trusted, or perhaps it's just ineffectual because of lack of resources, the question becomes, how can it deal with grand corruption outside? And here I go to Latin America for some examples. And with this, how much time do you have? Two minutes. Okay. Um, there have been some interesting examples recently, and I'm sure you've read about them in the paper, um, about special uh, units of prosecutors and police actually doing very effective investigations of, of prosecution, of, of corruption in some countries. In Brazil, where the, where, uh, the Bay Center just had its its, um, its, its, former, its last conference is a very good example. This worked in Brazil. Mexico has tried it repeatedly with federal prosecutors, judges, and police, and it hasn't worked out so well. So it's, it, is, it is a way, have an isolated unit that specializes in this, and try to keep it on, I guess, being the rest of the system isn't. Another example is, uh, and very interesting one is from Guatemala, which is CC, which is the International Commission for Against Impunity in Guatemala, which has brought about the fall of the president of the country, the vice president, and has under indictment or investigation by 140 um, uh, politicians and, and, uh, and business people. Now this is, is an international organization. It's been described as a mini ICC. It's really not, but it's, a, it's an investigative unit and it uses international experts as well as Guatemalans. It's been very effective. Uh, it doesn't help make the rest of the system honest, but it has fought the corrupt outside. However, it also requires a government <coughs> that's willing to, to, to have it, that's willing to invite it in, even with the arms slightly twisted. And then finally, there's the, there's the possibility, and I think some of my colleagues on the panel will talk about this, of international investigations that really circumvent the, the system. Uh, 
Uh, the Panama Papers, the Mbeki Report, have, have added fuel to this fire so that so that investigations can be done of money laundering or money that, it, that leaves and enters the country illegally without having to rely on local investigators. So perhaps the local system can't manage, impunity can still be fought. But my concern as someone who works with justice reform is what, how does this affect the lives of ordinary people when they try to get justice or their rights enforced? Trickle down from these external solutions doesn't work very well, or it is very slow. And so we've got a long haul to fight even petty corruption or systemic corruption, issues which perhaps are not as bad as, as uh, what happens in, in customs or in large uh, contracts for public works. But this is still a challenge for Africa as it is for other countries. And if we take resources, if we take time, and if they will go take some really Thank you, Lynn. Um, and now we'll turn to the FBI's Plutocracy Program founder, Deborah Thorvald. Uh, so, I'm David Mokuba, and um, I come at this situation from an investigator standpoint. What effect is uh, investigating a uh, cryptographic re regime of grand corruption in Africa, um, how is that thwarted by uh, and affected, how is well law affected, and it has a tremendous effect because the areas that I look at, it wasn't a corrupt individual, but it was a corrupt regime and it was systemic corruption. So, uh, as I remind uh, my, my former prosecutors, the FBI doesn't work for you, we work with you, and so we without investigators. And, um, and as an investigator in my former career with the FBI that worked international cases, I had to rely on my former, former and foreign counterparts. And if they were prevented from conducting investigations because the people they would be investigating outranked them, had power, and would, the ability to squash their investigations, that had an effect on uh, the United States' ability to conduct an investigation. Uh, frequently, the Ministry of Justice is part of that corrupt regime and is used as a tool by a kleptocratic regime to prosecute the opposition party and, uh, and repress that. So, as an international investigator, you have to be cognizant of the fact that you may be used as a tool to oppress the opposition and you don't want that to happen either. So you have to uh, make sure that information, evidence that you're obtaining abroad is not being tainted or manipulated to go after specific targets that are just the opposition. Um, the investigators themselves are subject to bribery and uh, or they just uh, know who pays their paycheck and where they're going to investigate. So to give an example, uh, Sonny Abacha was one of the success stories um, for the United States in that um, Sonny Abacha was a corrupt president who died in office in 1998 in Nigeria. During his time in power, he obtained more than $5 billion in corruption proceeds. $2.263 billion was stolen directly out of the Central Bank of Nigeria, and the other $2.8 billion was received in bribes and kickbacks. He was called Mr. 30%. Anybody seeking to do business in Nigeria had to pay 30% of the contract value to the Abacha regime. But, um, as you can see, the money moved out of Nigeria. It was, Nigeria's not a safe place to keep your money if you're going to be overthrown, or think you may be overthrown, so you keep your money to uh, international, the international banking system. Uh, which is very good for U.S. law enforcement because it allows you to trace U.S. dollars and work with your foreign partners to try to trace, freeze, and, and restrain money. In, in this case, the Swiss authorities found $723 million of the Abacha of money in bank accounts there. Um, his wife, Miriam, was caught at the airport with 100 suitcases stuffed with cash. <laughs> Um, they were uh, uh, taken. Uh, their son, Mohamed Abacho, was found with uh, $100 million, and that was recovered. And the money was found in France, the UK, Luxembourg, and the Channel Islands. 
Uh, the United States, working with the foreign partners, were able to file against $630 million of those funds. And uh, DOJ um, was able to forfeit, so far, $480 million of it. Uh, and of course, the United States does not keep those funds. They are working with the new Buhari government to return those funds to the government of Nigeria in such a way that there is a visible and recognizable benefit to the people of Nigeria. Um, and they're still uh, litigating $150 million. But if you look at the um, regime that, the regimes that came after Abacha, each one of them could be an Abacha story. Each one of them was a corrupt regime that took billions of dollars. Nigeria is the richest oil country in Africa, and yet the people live very poorly, and it is directly correlated to the amount of theft of government of funds. I mean, imagine if Abacha only took one billion, and four billion went into infrastructure, into schools, education, medicines, roads, and just the infrastructure of Nigeria, it would be a different Nigeria today. Um, examples, it's not just Abacha. So if you look, uh, you may be familiar with Denzani Allison Adarebe. She was the Minister of Petroleum in Nigeria. Uh, she was arrested in October by the uh, International Corruption Unit in the UK. They did an outstanding job and have arrested her. Um, I you know, was reading uh, some of the public source data uh, available out there, and they believe that there are, I think they just uh, two days ago, uh, seized an $18 million mansion that uh, was associated with Matt Wake. Uh, this was one of the quotes from Bill of Jonathan, stealing is not corruption. Well, I think a lot of people would beg to differ, <laughs> differ with that. But it's not, you could look at Avicenna, the, the Minister of Agriculture, you could look at all the different ministries, and each one of them was stealing money from their programs. So each one of those programs, ag agriculture, education, was suffering. Um, some of the recommendations uh, that I would recommend have to do with international cooperation and international tribunals, or uh, one of the things we've worked with in the government is trying to help educate investigators, but judges. Uh, while I was uh, an FBI agent, I went over and I testified in court in Bangladesh against the son of the former prime minister in Bangladesh. Uh, and it was cut and dry. You know, this woman says she paid a $750,000 bond, the money went into this bank account, and from this account, the son of the former prime minister had a debit card. Here are the charges on his debit card. A, B, C, well, here's the money, how we got it. Um, the judge that I testified with before had a heart attack. He was replaced by a judge who flew over to London, apparently met with the subject, flew back, acquitted him, not of what he was charged with, but, but something else that he wasn't charged with, and then resigned from the bench and fled to Malaysia. Wow. So um, I'm like, excuse me, is anybody overturning that acquittal? <laughs> uh, because you know, I risk life in London, I testify over there, but the bigger picture is he wasn't even acquitted of what he was charged with. Um, and so without honesty in the judicial system, you are not going to have, there is no rule of law when the law is applied uh, evenly. Uh, the person whose bank account into which the funds went was found guilty. The person who spent the money on the account was acquitted. Uh, so uh, hopefully that will be addressed in, in Bangladesh. But it is a systemic problem, as Lynn said, because it's not, I mean, if the president is corrupt, uh, if the attorney general is corrupt, then how can you even hope that the investigators can go out and gather evidence and can bring a case. Uh, I met with foreign uh, investigators in Africa and I said, how do you start an investigation? And they go, well, the first thing we do is we send a letter to the subject and we tell them to do an investigation. And then we allow them weeks later to come in. And I'm like, so you give them time to make up a good excuse, falsify documents, and come up with a plan. I'm like, not a good plan, not a good investigative strategy. 
Uh, one of the things they teach on the FBI is if the FBI asks you a question, assume we already know the answer. And, and that's because before we ever approach you, we conduct a thorough investigation. We know, like, we know that you got coffee at Starbucks this morning, you know? And so I know where you're going, where your family is going, I know who your family is, I know where you put your money, I know what you drive. And it's that level of thoroughness and investigation to know, because people don't hide money, they put it in their mistress's name, they put it in their wife's name, they put it in their kids' name. You have to know uh, where money is spent in Africa is different than how uh, oligarchs spend money in Ukraine. In Africa, uh, it's so much patronage. They're paying for loyalty. They're paying tribal groups to support them in the next election. So uh, the concerns of Africa are a little different, and yet investigatively, you won't have good investigations, you won't have good prosecutions if you don't have fairness and independence within the judicial system for both investigators and prosecutors. Thank you, Deborah. Um, now we'll turn to Thomas Denon for passing most of the anti corruption legislation in my beer. Thank you very much, Harry. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, uh, Eric is quite right when he talks about uh, my transaction and interaction with the uh, passage of legislation in Liberia. So, as a matter of fact, I've seen a whole country evolved in this fight against corruption. And it is exciting and sometimes heartbreaking. And the reason why I say heartbreaking is because if you look at uh, Liberia and you juxtapose it with a lot of other African countries, you realize that if we were just focusing on uh, the institutions, the legislations, the tools we have to fight corruption, many African countries, including Liberia, would be a paragon of integrity. We will, we, will, we, we will be sitting on top of the world. But unfortunately, corruption fights back. And in that process, implementation is quite difficult. And implementation is quite difficult because as you pass this legislation, obviously, in the process of making them effective, persecution comes. And when persecution comes, you now have to interact with a system that is ingrained in patronage, nepotism, a lot of different forms of uh, corruption that is entrenched in society. The other point with regards to how we have to fight corruption in Africa is the issue of institutions. But then we also have to link institutions to the issue of political will. Now, while political will is important and while institutions are also important, it appears that at some point along the, 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 the process of consolidating the fight against corruption, there is the need for a leader to rise up. I don't know wherever he comes from but that will exhibit the, the, the kind of will that is needed to institutionalize integrity in the system. Many times we fail to, 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 to have that quality of leadership, and at times we think the leadership is only from the top. But the issue of uh, leadership through the system evolves whether it's leadership in the courts, leadership in the police, leadership in the Ministry of Justice. Leadership has to be a, 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 a systemic. Leadership has to be systemic. Now, why it's important that leadership from the top is very important, especially, say, from the president of a country, 
because in many instances, officials in, 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 in the country work at the will and pleasure of the president. If you take the case of Liberia, we've had some very interesting situation with persecution because you can be the Minister of Justice today, you are, you are, you are persecuting a case, and tomorrow morning the president can reshuffle you, you know, dismiss you or reshuffle you, and no one's going to ask any question. So all of these are serious impediments. But let me focus a bit on, on the, the issue of the, the, the courts. And then I will also focus on the police and then the Ministry of Justice, which I will link to uh, anti-corruption commissions and all of that. You know, many times uh, the courts are demonized. Yeah, they are quite disappointing. The courts are quite disappointing. But the reality is the, the courts are not really the disaster that we think they are. And the reason why I say this is because not many corruption cases get to the courts. Not many corruption cases get to the courts. The point is, before when corruption cases Say from, from in, in, in our case in Liberia, there's so many cases, uh, many and many uh, cases of corruption formed by the General Auditing Commission. But the point is, who's going to take those cases, investigate them, and then subsequently take it to, to the, the, the courts? It never gets to the courts because law enforcement, the police, persecution, in most instances, they, they are compromised. And it's cause for concern. If you have law enforcement, a law enforcement sector that will, 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 will tarnish evidence, that will fail to, to um, arrest people because they've, they've given them bribes, then you have a challenge. The same thing with persecution. So many cases will come up into the public uh, uh, fiat, and those cases now get to court. But then obviously the, 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 the courts are also complicit because when cases get to the courts, then you also have some problem, problems. Say for instance, we have situations uh, where the jurors Jurors are compromised. There was a time in Liberia where you had hung jurors. So if you have a hung jury, all you needed to do was just to bribe one of the jurors, which was, which was quite uh, 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 interesting. So uh, many times when, when cases went to court, the, 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 the corrupt party wanted the, the jurors to, to sit on the case. So the more corrupt you are, the, the, you, you want the juror to sit on the case. But, but, but that has already been rectified. The, the, that, that process has been rectified because it was quite heartbreaking with many corruption cases. So um, <clears throat> in conclusion, I think the issue of uh, ensuring that our institutions have uh, credible people who will ensure that um, the law is effectively implemented is quite critical in the procedural process. And as we uh, proceed with this process, I hope uh, some of the issues uh, raised by my colleagues and some of the issues that I intend to continue to, 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 to explain will come up and I will give additional insights to those points. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. And now to our last speaker, uh, a person who spent his, it seems like his entire career either investigating or prosecuting corruption or advising in the United States, or advising officials both in the U.S. and outside the U.S. on corruption issues. Uh, Peter uh, Thank you, Eric. And uh, let me just say that when I hear an, an introduction like that, very kind words, uh, but it makes me feel old. <laughs> Maybe doing this too long. But uh, let me start 
in the brief time uh, that we have, and really I think it's quite wise that we save some time to hear from you, and I'd like, like to do that, uh, is um, I'd like to start with some good news and some bad news. Um, and <clears throat> as the joke usually goes, the good news comes first, right? And uh, the good news is uh, that I do a lot of work in Africa, Asia and uh, the Balkans as well, but a lot of work in Africa. And I've been in many, many countries uh, over the last few years. This is kind of a pre-retirement job of mine. But um, let me start with some developments that I see as positive. I think are positive. And one of them is uh, that throughout Africa, both in Francophone and in, uh, in Anglo-speaking uh, Africa, we are seeing the growth of anti-corruption commissions. These are units that are put together with often very competent people. They're given tools to do their job. Uh, often the, uh, the strongest tools available, they have subpoena power, they can conduct searches, they do all the things that we prosecutors in the United States do, or can do. And some of them have done it. Many of the tools uh, that are given to them and responsibilities given to them also involve, uh, involve the prevention side, which is important. Uh, prosecutors tend to forget that at times, but it's an important part of the equation. <clears throat> so we have these new units that are created with, uh, you know, uh, by law using proper language, language that that. that uh, that recognizes the importance of the rule of law. And I've seen some of the cases, some of the commissioners who sat down with me and said, well, here's what we've got, and we collected this, and we took this step, we traced these assets, and uh, they have assembled some decent cases against not just the traffic cop, you know, not just the low-level, low-hanging uh, corruption cases, but against mid-level and even beyond that. Uh, individuals in their country. And I've seen some of that. So that's a good thing, right? We cannot argue with that. I think that that's a positive. We've also seen, I've seen personally, the rise in uh, the level of international cooperation, which in big corruption cases is absolutely necessary. I mean, the, um, the usual leader doesn't embezzle money, doesn't accept bribes, and walk down to the local bank and put it in the local bank. He finds himself a bank in London, or a house in Malibu, or any number of ways to invest this money that are far away from the eyesight of the, the uh, investigators and prosecutors who might come looking. So um, international cooperation is key to build a domestic corruption case, it's key for us to build a asset forfeiture case or a, a foreign corrupt practices case, a foreign bribery case. And we've seen that happen. One of uh, the examples I want to give you, I feel quite personally responsible for. I have six countries in a small country called Sierra Leone. We're in Freetown. And I've brought a prosecutor who's, been, who's known by some of uh, the panelists is a guy who has made a living tracing assets and doing what we call kleptocracy cases, like the Ogion case, like the Lazarenko case uh, out of Ukraine, uh, like the Taiwan uh, case recently. And um, so they have, uh, we, we get some visitors uh, at lunch, after lunch, Senegalese judges and prosecutors. They pull us aside discreetly and said, we want to talk to you. We don't, this was 2009, I believe, the election hasn't happened yet, but we think that the Watt family uh, may be leaving power. And we'd like your assistance because we've got a pretty good case going right now. If in fact uh, they leave, we'd like to move forward, both in terms of the tracing assets and in terms of bringing charges. And so we talked about it, and it was established that, in fact, if some of these allegations were true, then it might be a money laundering offense in the United States and a domestic corruption uh, offense in Senegal. So we entered into a pact that yesterday we would work together, and Brian decided that uh, 
he was he had the ability to do that, and he did. Uh, you all know the rest of the story. Uh, the Watt family lost the election. Uh, they were prosecuted uh, successfully, and um, Kareem, at this point, is headed to jail if he's not there right now. The son. So, good story, right? Positive. Good result. Working together, two countries, to determine whether money flowed out of Senegal and into real estate in Manhattan. Uh, Obiang case, I think everybody knows a little bit about that. A house was taken, a plane was taken, cars were taken, Michael Jackson's club was taken, probably the most significant item. And uh, it was all taken because why? It was purchased with the proceeds of corruption. Corruption in the, in the small country of Equatorial Guinea, but nonetheless, corruption. I want to, uh, well, I'll get to this in a moment. Foreign bribery cases keep coming uh, and unfortunately are happening the, uh, in the continent quite often, but we have worked together with countries. And uh, lastly, not leastly, but lastly, uh, the leaders of most recently Kenya, Nigeria, Senegal, and other big nations are speaking out very vocally against corruption. And of course, I told you Kareem Wad was convicted a pretty good result, I think, um, in a fair and open trial, according to most uh, observers and myself. I, I was in Senegal three times last year. So what am, what's the bad news? I mean, this is all good news, right? Positive. Why? Well, how can I find bad news in this? Well, I'm a prosecutor. I'm paid to find bad news. I'm paid to look on the dark side, and unfortunately, if you scratch the surface and look carefully, there are some problems here. The first one is, let's go back to the anti-corruption commissions. Looks good on paper, nice words, good language, but where do these cases go in most countries? Where do these cases go? They don't go to the prosecutor's office. They don't go to the gendarmes or the law enforcement side of the house. They go into the president's office. And a decision is made in the president's office whether we move forward with this case. Now, we all know about the UN Convention Against Corruption. We all know that there is several, there are several provisions in there that require the prosecutor and the judge to be independent. What does that mean? Well, it's independent of political interference. And if corruption cases are sent to the supreme political leader in your country, is that independence? I suspect not. I had one of these commissioners, I spent some time with him, and he said, you know, it's interesting. We send some good cases into the president's office, nothing ever comes out of the president's office. It's a one-way trip. It never comes out. Well, we can ask why, and I have some ideas, but let me tell you another story. Customs agent, uh, or a prosecutor told me, now, I said, what was your good case, your best case in the last few years? And he said, you know, we had a good case against the customs officials. We locked them all up, brought charges, things were going well, until the union leader comes and knocks on my door and says, uh, hey, he didn't say, You're, my guys are innocent. He said, you know, I got a bigger case against the Department of Defense, the Army. This is a big case that implicates high-level officials, and you ought to look at it. Next thing that happens, the president finds out, calls down, and says, let those customs guys go. Let them out of jail. Why? Because they were innocent? No. Because it could turn out to be an even bigger scandal that tarnishes the political reputation of the current administration. I'm not sure that they were the president's people or not, but no president likes to see that on their watch. So, what am I getting at? What's missing here is independence. Independence from political interference. And the point that I'm trying to make is until that is achieved in any country, in our country, 
in Canada, in, you know, uh, Peru, doesn't matter. Until that's achieved, you're never going to be able to tackle the problems of integrity in the judiciary, of professionalism, for lack thereof, in the judiciary. Because if all these folks are doing in the prosecutor's office and the judge's office is stamping the president's decisions, why do they care if they make a little something something on the side? It's not part, they're not invested in the system. It's not their system. It's just a larger country where the president calls the shots. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, but I think it's a necessary predicate to uh, bringing some level of justice to uh, the continent. And I'm not saying all countries are suffering, but many are. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, so, because Peter was senior to me at the Department of Justice and was the boss of some of my friends, it seems only uh, fair that I pick on him now. Um, Peter, um, I'm sure you've heard, you know, the the suspicions of uh, lawyers in countries around the world that the U.S. government brings these actions against foreign companies um, to get a competitive advantage, or the one that I heard um, uh, some people in Brazil say is that the prosecutors on the FIFA matter did that to have the U.S. have better control over worldwide soccer. Um, and I, you know, though these are typically intelligent lawyers from, say, Brazil, um, I think most people just dismiss that as nonsense. But when you think about maybe, uh, think about the West Africa country that's developing oil, not one of the big producers, might have an oil field offshore, and they need a giant company like say, single SBM offshore, giant Dutch company who produces billion dollar floating platforms that can help a country like this develop the oil and can move this billion dollar platform in. And then there's, you know, a consultant there who says, you know, we're going to allow this to happen. It's good for the people of country A, but you need to just kick a little something over to the guy you know, who, who makes the decision and provides the license. So that happens, the people of this country might start realizing the benefits of the natural resources, potentially, and then the Department of Justice comes in and investigates, and then the investment partners start pulling out because now this looks like a bad deal, and the oil doesn't get, get, get developed, and the people don't get the benefit of that. Now that might be a situation where people might say the Department of Justice isn't doing well for the people of that country. And this isn't just some intelligent lawyer in, 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 in Africa or in Brazil. And I just want to read you a paragraph from The Economist, and the date is August 30th, 2014. There's an interesting article about the criminalization of business, and saying companies must be punished when they do wrong, but the legal system has become an extortion racket. And the first paragraph reads, Who runs the most lucrative shakedown operation in the world? The Sicilian Mafia? The People's Liberation Army in China? The kleptocracy in the Kremlin? If you're a big business, all of these are less grasping than America's regulatory system. The formula is simple. Find a large company that may or may not have done something wrong, threaten its managers with commercial ruin, preferably with criminal charges, force them to use their shareholders' money to pay an enormous fine to drop the charges in a secret settlement so nobody can check the details, then repeat with another large company. How do you respond not just to the lawyers that say you're doing this to get competitive advantage for American companies, but to the economists, you know, widely read, respected news outlet? Yeah, well, I read that article too, and obviously I disagree with it. Uh, let me just pick on the lawyers for a minute. I mean, you know, I would say that you're just saying that because you're made to say that. Just saying. <laughs> well, not me, I'm just... No, 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 no. Yeah, but there's a bunch of lawyers who are furthering that argument. Uh, but I think that it is something that's worth uh, talking about. The end result of prosecutions, ultimately, and I think history will show this, because there was a time, you know, the FCPA was a function of the Clean Government Acts and progressive reforms after Watergate. <coughs> It wasn't used enormously at, at the beginning of its life. It is now. Um, it, I'm not saying enormously, but it's used frequently. It's used both to clean up corporate culture and to prevent 
of bribe accepting and taking or giving in uh, third world countries or developing nations. I would honestly question someone who's going to argue that because a bribe wasn't taken that the people of the country somehow suffered. And I hate to pick on countries, but basically in Nigeria up to this point, I think she says otherwise. You know, bribes have been paid enormously in Nigeria. That is beyond reproof because there have been cases that have been brought, Halliburton being one of the biggest. And yet the average person on the street of Lagos still is making a small amount per day. So uh, I don't think that that's a valid argument. But the point is that our corporate culture has changed. It's changed because of these enforcement mechanisms. That's not the only thing, but it's helped. It's helped to nudge people, even people who perhaps are not the most uh, morally aware or ethically inclined people, to stop doing <coughs> these kinds of things uh, because they could go to jail. And so I think that ultimately, incrementally, the world is getting to be a better place and business is becoming cleaner both in the developed, uh, developing world and the developed world. So I have got to disagree with you. Okay. Um, we'll take questions in the audience or I'll just keep trying to prod the participants into comments. Please, sir. Could you part since I have the mic? I'll ask a question. No, I'll pass it on to whoever wants it after that. Um, Stuart Kerwood Jones Day. A question, I guess it's mostly for Berlin, but perhaps for Thomas and others. Um, a number of us here in the room have been or continue to be involved with uh, legal and judicial reform projects that are funded by entities such as the World Bank, USAID, Asia Development Bank, European Union, and you know, billions of dollars have been spent, either loan money or as grants. Um, I can think of a hundred million dollars that the World Bank spent on a Russian legal judicial reform project. The Asian Development Bank close to 200 million in Pakistan. I never read the final reports, but my guess is they weren't totally successful. And I'm curious for observations that either of you or really any of you, because you've all been in this as well. What do those projects typically, in sort of one or two points, get wrong in the worst way? Because this is one of the things that developing countries and development institutions like to think that we will spend X dollars on this subject and we will get Y result. And I think we're often disappointed. So if you have thoughts of things that tend to go wrong in the inception of these often very large projects. What goes wrong, I think, depends on, on who the donors are. And first, uh, the World Bank actually now has a $100 million project in Kenya, but it really hasn't done much in, in Africa with judicial reform. Uh, however, it's done it and the other uh, MDBs, multi, multilateral development banks, have had huge projects elsewhere. And generally, too much, too fast, uh, no considerate, no understanding of the politics of the situation, and I'm known as Miss Anti-Infrastructure. Buildings aren't going to get you very far, nor are just writing a bunch of new laws that probably will never be enacted. Um, I think that, that the donors are learning slowly, <laughs> and uh, I saw with interest that AID has uh, has focused now on uh, the justice sector doing budgeting for results, which I think is important in Latin America. That is to say, if we're going to put the money in, we want to know how you're going to improve. And my question increasingly has become, when I talk to people in these countries, okay, so if you get this, what am I, as a potential party to a legal case or someone who's a victim of a crime, what am I going to see? How, how is the service that I get going to be approved? And I think that, that there hasn't been enough focus on that in most of these projects. Uh, I've just worked with, a, with an interesting World Bank project in Serbia, which is actually very small. It's not building anything. It's not putting in equipment. 
is just working with the Serbian judiciary and prosecutors on small projects that are intended to improve their performance. Whether they're working on it, I don't know, but it's, it's I think, quite a bit better than $100 million going into buildings. Not, not that that's necessarily what's happening in Kenya, but I don't know how you can spend that much money without a lot of buildings. Other comments from the panel or other questions from the audience? Yes, please. Thank you so much for your comments. My name is Alima Jamal. I'm with the Public International Foreign Policy Group. I wanted to ask a question about the interaction between corruption and transitional justice. So, especially for countries like South Sudan that are emerging from conflict, that are in the process of thinking about how to set up new transitional justice systems. What are ways in which the country and people supporting the country um, can put an eye towards lessening the effects of corruption? And I guess even a precursor to that question is, how does corruption and transitional justice in that whole process interact? What's that one? Okay, <laughs> Deborah. South Sudan is one of the five countries that the century focuses on, because we specifically look at violent kleptocracy in countries where the kleptocracy is fueling war crime and atrocities. And so as the new unity government has come into South Sudan, uh, you have so many situations that are occurring, because there's tribalism, there's patronage, uh, patronage, it's going to take, in my opinion, international pressure and intervention and cooperation because uh, there, just yesterday, there were, was a conviction of 16 um, people that had worked in the office of the president who were convicted of corruption. Um, they stole $14 million out of the office of the presidency. Um, however, they were sentenced to life in prison for uh, all 14. So there is question as to, was that justice? If it, you know, um, was there a rush to judgment to show that they are um, fighting corruption in South Sudan as part of the new unity government? Um, were all 14 equally, was there a broad brush, or were they addressed individually? Were all 14 equally involved in the theft? So uh, to move forward, uh, South Sudan specifically is missing $4 billion from their coffers over the last few years. And um, so to successfully address corruption in that country, it's going to take all of the uh, international partners because the great majority of the money has left South Sudan, which means it's not there. So you need the United States, Kenya, Uganda, Ethiopia, the, the neighboring countries where uh, a lot of assets are offshore, and um, the international partners to try to assist them moving forward with making sure that there is judicial review, that, that, that uh, all of the, not only are people prosecuted, but it, are the assets recovered so that they can be repatriated and help the new unity government with their budget. Right now, uh, the situation exists where uh, there's a lot of uncertainty between the opposition party and the, and the former uh, cure regime. Now they've got the unity government. They're going to have to start looking at not just prosecuting one or, or the other, but having a fair and impartial approach to the, cor the corruption that has existed for the last several years. But it, I don't think without international cooperation, you're going to have, uh, as was mentioned, lack of pressure being put on cases. Will the judiciary have an independent approach to addressing corruption? And I think the best way moving forward, whether it's something similar to the International uh, Criminal Court or an International Corruption Court, uh, uh, assisting South Sudan with addressing the level of corruption that's existed. A question in the back here, unless there are other comments on that question. Hi, thanks. I'm Jim Roberts. I edit the Rule of Law section of the Index Faculty on Freedom of Heritage Foundation. And uh, it's been my experience that a lot of these problems, these legal political problems in countries, 
stem from larger problems in the culture that are beyond government. This government can't solve these things alone. These are problems uh, you know, with institutions of civil society that are outside of government, um, weak morality, um, problems uh, you know, as in Africa, as the tribal problems that go way back historical issues. But how can the issues that you're talking about, the projects and the people and the lawyers, join together uh, to, you know, create positive change for the culture at large? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so much of uh, our intervention in Liberia has been uh, not just engaging with the government, but engaging with communities at the subnational level. And to a large extent, uh, fighting corruption is not just a pers about persecution, it's about also sensitizing so that uh, the voice of, of, of the people become an integral part of that process. Say, one of our projects we, 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 we ran uh, around police, the police. Um, so Human Rights Watch comes up with this report that we launched with them. And a lot of issues were raised in, in, in the report. And then the, the police director, uh, the, the police director of operation was present. And he was very mad at, 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 because of uh, much of what was uh, reflected in the report. And then we launched this, 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 this project, and then I took him to the communities. I took him to the communities. And in the process, people in the community Community started to speak about the same issues that were in the report. And then I said to him, You remember the report? Imagine what these people are saying is just what these people saw. Because at times this is there's pushback because human rights watch is you know an external party. But the reality is some of the issues that international organizations find is not very different from what local organizations find. So corruption um, is ingrained in the system, and the extent to which citizens can interact with the process is very uh, 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 important. Because even the issue of perception, if you look at the, 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 the different reports that comes out from Transparency International, say for instance, the Global uh, Corruption Barometer, if you look at uh, three indicators, the uh, political, the, the impact of politics on corruption, you look at the judiciary and you look at police. Now, you can draw some conclusions. Out of 107 countries, more than, more, more than 50 believe that the political culture, the, the, the culture of corruption with politics is very high. If you look at the, the, the police, 20 countries, no, 30 countries, and out of those 30 countries, 19 are from Africa, felt that the police was highly corrupt. If you look at the judiciary, about 20 countries, and they felt that the, 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 the judiciary system was highly corrupt. Now, you can, if, you, if you look at the, the link, you can see the issue of political influence. How political influence tend to affect the, 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 the whole functioning of the judiciary, the police, those are instruments. The police is an instrument that the political elites use, like I said earlier, to, to team cases. If you want to arrest somebody and the police is not independent, you need to get nothing done. The same way with, 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 with prosecutors. You get nothing done because those different apparatus can, can be uh, uh, tempered with. But I, I, I believe strongly, and that's one of what we've continued to work on, that the voice of the people, they usually say the voice of the people, the voice of God. So the more the people are sensitized and become part and parcel of the, the process, 
I think the more important it is, you know, the, in, in getting corruption or, or tackled. Yeah, um, sure, Peter. So I think that those are wonderful points, and I completely agree. I think also, though, the role of these international conventions and these regional anti-corruption conventions is, is important. I mean, it's, um, you saw the, the uh, quote from Jonathan Goodluck, uh, we have heard much of this in the Obion case too, which is, well, culturally what I did is quite acceptable, quite acceptable. Um, well, it's actually not, and by the way, you just signed this convention against corruption and it says unequivocally that it's not acceptable, and it's corruption, and so, I think as a family of nations, we're coming together in terms of some really basic concepts of what is acceptable and what's not, and that becomes a threshold. Uh, and I do think the poorest person in the poorest country, in the poorest continent, you know, anywhere, is going to be able to say, hey, we signed this as a nation and our leaders made some promises to us, and we're entitled to have them fulfill these promises. So it's bringing us all together in terms of, and moving us away from these cultural uh, arguments that, oh, it's okay here, but it's not okay there. I'm gonna disagree a little. I mean, it, I think the cultural argument is probably overdrawn. A, a, a prosecutor in Ethiopia told me that, well, corruption is just something that the it's a concern of the West. It's not something that is a concept here, and I think that's completely untrue. But there are problems with people's needs, and if uh, I can uh, get a job or get some help from my from my child uh, from a politician who may or may not be corrupt, I will vote for them. I think rather than worrying about a convention, which I may not be able to read. There's also a problem of just exposure in terms of media, people may not know what's going on, may not realize that uh, the oil money is going somewhere else. So I'm not sure how much a convention matters, but there is there is a, a need to make people sense that they can do something about it. And although I haven't worked in, the, in Africa anywhere long as long as many of you, I have seen changes in Latin America. I mean, Guatemala is up in arms now about the corruption that was uncovered by CC. You see the Brazilians in the street. Now half of them maybe still wanted to keep Lula out of jail and the other half wanted to put him in. But at least there have been changes uh, in a country that was just as patrimonial and just as dependent on, uh, on patronage as any African country. So there's, there's room for change, but I'm not sure how much the conventions are going to do. Disagreement. Well, going to, to Brazil um, and, and talking about how the country might be um, moving to the right place, right? There's so many people that are optimistic that Brazil might become less corrupt, um, and, and that's certainly a good thing. At the same time, though, uh, when benefits of anti-corruption programs might help the, the, the small person, the, the poor person, the working class, the, the burdens or the, the pain of the process affects them greatly too. And in one absolutely heartbreaking story in NPR just a few weeks ago, it was a, a father of some small children, married, and they felt like they were finally breaking into the middle class. They had a car, they had a house, and he was working at a, a Petrobras refinery in some part of the country that otherwise didn't have a lot going on. And when the scandal broke, when the investigation came, all these projects were shut down. And he said, and it was really heartbreaking as a father of two little girls to hear him say, I quite frankly, I was doing well, now I don't know what I'm gonna give my little girl for breakfast tomorrow. And you think, wow, this is really a painful process. Though it may lead to a better place, the people that are suffering aren't the senators and the congressmen who have bank accounts in Luxembourg, Liechtenstein, or Switzerland. It's the person who used to have a car and now can't feed his young daughter. Yeah, and the, we also don't know how many of these people are being investigated or going to end up in jail. Uh, Brazil has a wonderful system for staying out of jail. Uh, while you might appeal, you can go on for a Yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, yeah. Uh, but I'm not sure that that is true. That that people are affected negatively by this. But I'm also hearing people say. Uh, I remember once 
arguing in, in Ecuador with a group of, of, uh, of, uh, of farmers and talking about the need for an anti-corruption program. And they said, what difference does it make? It's just a fight between politicians. Actually, they use so much nasty word. But, but the idea was that it you know, the people on top. It doesn't make well, there, there are some questions, but we have time for at least one, if not two more questions. So uh, we have one right here. Stuart, as opposed to the mic. Oh, then we should go to the back as well. Uh, thank you, panelists. Um, my name is Yi Hongzhang, and I um, come uh, from, uh, yeah, I'm with an international investor. I'm a Chinese uh, nationalist, so I kind of know a little bit about this and the thing. So I have a question about the international cooperation. So uh, I would like to know how can um, how U.S. how can U.S. Uh, accommodate or uh, solve the challenges of the legal difference. So, for example, that um, one Chinese government want to, um, wants U.S. court to free some stolen assets, but U.S. court needs uh, an order signed by our judge. But in China, that order can be signed just by a prosecutor. But that's not efficient, that's sufficient here. And on the other hand, uh, like Emma just mentioned, that uh, during this mutual legal assistance, some of the evidence came from us that we do not go through due diligence or independent judicial review. So, yes, we do have these legal differences, but does that mean that uh, those corrupt officials who fled to the US are free because we just cannot accommodate these legal differences? Not generally something to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I used to laugh on Sandwich Origin Commission, but apparently the Department of Justice grants on that. Um, no, I mean, there are other options. And so uh, I understand what you're saying. So sometimes uh, the burden of proof in another country doesn't meet U.S. standards, and therefore through the MLA, Mutual Labor Assistance Program, uh, we can't honor a foreign warrant. However, if the money is in the United States, there are other options. Uh, you could, uh, through mutual legal assistance or just request, ask the United States to open an investigation. And if we can conduct an investigation, uh, restraining funds, we might be able to get a restraining order based on the, uh, the amount of evidence from a foreign country, if not a seizure warrant, and then possibly conduct an investigation in the United States and show at least sufficient probable cause that the Chinese official whose funds came to the United States has a salary equivalent to $45,000 a year, and yet has $8 million in the bank account in the United States, and the funds appear through oh, investigation to have the United States or Brian pay back, back, back or when they or were sent to the United States funds, then the United States might be able to find the last action in the United States. United States. So the point of the U.S. versus $8 million, and better if we can get sufficient evidence out of the Chinese country, there so are other avenues the United States can take the idea of action ourselves if one of the four burden of it. evidence can't meet the burden in the United States. So there, there are avenues. Yeah, if, if I could just follow up a little bit, um, that's absolutely true, and we don't have to talk about this in the abstract. Uh, in fact, taking it back to the Far East, just recently uh, we received a request from the government of Taiwan to freeze and ultimately seize assets that had been laundered in the United States by their former president. They said to us, we will take care of the president, and they did. They brought a strong case against him, and he's in jail right now, along with his wife and a few other people who carried the money to California and elsewhere. But the important part is that we, given our tools, were able trace those assets in the United States and to liquidate them and send them back to Taiwan. And we did so, I, we don't always uh, do a great job, but this was a pretty, pretty efficient operation. Uh, and so there are other avenues. Um, just to say, I mean, that was a very subtle entree for me. Um, Eric does apologize, he has a plane to catch, so uh, unfortunately he stuck with me for the next 10 minutes as well. But uh, with that, I think we still have a couple of more questions on that. And um, so we have a bit more time, but let's try to make it as quick as we can so we can uh, go through most, most of these questions. Thanks. Uh, so my name is Amanda Rawls. I'm the African Director of the Rule of Law Initiative at the American Bar Association. And my question is for Thomas. Um, I really appreciated the comment that you made about the importance of uh, institutionalizing integrity and of individual leaders needing to rise up, maybe not at the executive level, presidential level necessarily, but individual leaders within the country needing to rise up to do that. From the point of view of 
efforts on strengthening justice reform and law reform and trying to contribute somehow from the outside. I'm wondering if you have any suggestions for how to help foster that process, how to facilitate that process from the outside, uh, whether there are institutions that, that one can support to clear a way to make that more likely, or if you think that in, in situations like, I'm going to give a country example, but in situations where that, that integrity is not institutionalized yet, if it does more harm than good for organizations to bring in foreign assistance to claim to be Yeah, um, <clears throat> that's a very interesting comment and uh, question. And uh, the American Bar Association uh, uh, did some work in Liberia with the University of Liberia Law School and a couple of organizations. But I think there's something fundamentally wrong with, you know, international assistance. Say, some of the engagement that you say does in countries like Liberia, you know, bringing these big contractors. And it's, it's, it's almost like they are in and out. So they get a contract for, for five years or three years, millions of dollars, and then they are in and out. And this is a major problem. And it appears people do not want to talk about these problems. Interventions in education, intervention with the media, Millions of dollars come in, those contractors leave, there's no sustainability. So the, the, the key warrior is the issue of sustainability. How do you sustain these engagements? Now I say uh, you have to be able to work with local organizations. You have to be able to work with local organizations. We all talk about ownership, but in fact it's, it's almost like a facade, you know? We, we, we speak about ownership at conferences, but when we get on the ground, we do not want, want to work with local organizations. And some of the excuses we, we give is the issue of capacity. Now, I find it very difficult to believe that a whole country, you know, the, 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 the excuses you give for bringing experts will be because, you know, there's no capacity. How do we create capacity? Is it about degree? So there are some very fundamental flaws with, with regards to how engagements are done, you know, in countries like Liberia, and that's the reason nothing happens. You spend millions, the education system rots. To the point the president said, our education system is a mess. You spend a lot of money, you know, in the legal system, and nothing happens. So the other point is, that was when I, when, I, when I talked about building institutions, but also institutions just do not stay alone. Institutions is about also individuals, the quality of the individual. Are we interacting with individuals such that those individuals have the willpower to stand against the system? So Liberia is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is a valid example of how you can have laws, but laws just do not work. Many of the laws, we talk about the anti-corruption or, 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 or the UN anti-corruption um, convention, the African Union anti-corruption convention. If you go through the um, through UNCA and you look at all that Liberia has done, and it's amazing, Liberia has an anti-corruption uh, 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 anti commission, we have a public uh, uh, procurement commission, we have an, uh, we, we've made our, and in, in turn, our auditing commission independent and no longer reports to the president. We, we, we have a public financial management act. We have an act on freedom of information. We have a whistleblower protection act. I will go on and on and on. <coughs> but the point is, what has happened to those institutions? Those institutions are now becoming an opportunity for the political elites to appoint their cronies. So Liberia is a case where, yeah, if laws can be used as making progress, we've made substantial progress. But if laws should be used to create ineffective you know, institutions, 
where citizens' lives are not being impacted, then we do not need laws. So I think uh, uh, the, the American Bar Association engagement with the University of Liberia, for me, I, I point that as very useful. I think that was one of the most useful interventions because many other institutions will not even engage with the university. I find it quite interesting that you want to intervene in a country and you do not believe that, you know, the university is an integral part of that process. Most of these international assistance should be going to the university because that way knowledge is sustained, research is, is, is 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 a left step. So you have all the proliferation of all these and 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 and, and, and contractors, and they leave. They leave nothing. Well, I mean, I I I, I work with the U.S. Embassy before. I feel frustrated with that. But they appear. They, they, it appears also that when you speak out against these things, people tend to marginalize you. But I mean, these are fundamental questions. And until we start to, to, to uh, listen to the voices of those who have alternative views, we'll just be chunking money down the hole. We're throwing millions down the hole, and countries like Liberia, there should be no reason why Liberia should remain what it is. Since the war, if you look at how much has been spent, billions. Look at Ebola, I can give an example of Ebola. I remember the, a, a, a report was sent to me that about $3 billion was spent on Ebola. I found it very interesting. I stayed in the country during Ebola. I, well, I mean, there were, there were, everybody you can think about was appeared in, in Liberia. And most of the people were at hotels enjoying themselves. They were not working. Civil society organizations were in the trenches, were in communities. We, you know, people, when, when I hear some of the reports, it appears as if citizens did not even participate. Do you think we need, do you think like we, we do not have the capacity to have experts to, to be able to, 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 to give information to our citizens? I have seen situations where someone tells me that, you know, we brought an expert to, to teach you, to teach your, your staff how to interact with local officials. I found that very, 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 very interesting. And I think I said, never, never, never invite me to that, to that program again because we have interacted with local officials. In fact, we, 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 we have as much experience as you can ever think. So I think I also support that engagement, but I think there must be, there must, there must be some uh, narrowing of that relationship such that we gain from each other. But to just imagine that, you know, there's no capacity in the whole country. In fact, what is capacity? You know, every one of us, we have to be able to look at the, the, the strength of, of a very individual. If you look at capacity from a holistic perspective, you might be able to write. I might be able to make the speech better. So, some of our countries have capacity. It may not be as much as you might expect, but capacity grows. But that whole idea of, of you know, having all this intervention, and not sustaining it, you know, is a very critical issue, and we need to deal with sustainability. Um, with that, I can't really sort of think of any better way to, to really conclude um, with that sort of very thoughtful reflection, Thomas, so thank you very much for that. Um, I hope you'll agree with me that that has been a very interesting discussion, really, about the um, topic of uh, prosecuting corruption in Africa. Um, I, of course, want to thank on, on Mary's behalf, on, on John Say's behalf, on Ben Sims' behalf, uh, all of our panelists for the time that they've taken tonight to uh, share your thoughts. Um, and I would invite all of you to partake in some refreshments, uh, but before that, of course, uh, to thank our speakers the way we know best.